Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology and in this video I'm going to be summarising everything you need to know for Cambridge International Education A Level for topics 1, 2, 3 and 4 which all come up on paper 1 and 2. So this is going to be your go-to as a revision or quick learning for a lesson or consolidation so that you've got everything you need in one place for those topics. So if you're here trying to prepare for your exams coming up in May or June, this is perfect for you. Now, one of the most common questions I get from students is how to use my entire topic videos to maximize their progress. And one key thing that I recommend is using a platform like Scrintle, where you can take all of these ideas and creatively put them together into a structured form. So you can make really good mind map style notes where you can see how everything connects together. You can have cards for all the key ideas. So I'm gonna quickly show show you an example of how I would use a platform like Scrintle to maximize using these YouTube videos to make the most epic set of revision notes to really help maximize your progress and to plan your learning. Visual note taking helps to capture creative ideas using canvas, boards and cards that you have here on Scrintle. And I particularly like how you can visually link ideas to structure your thoughts. And in this case, show connections between topics, which is gonna be so key when you have to start to do those application questions to show how all of the knowledge links together, rather than thinking of everything you learn as a separate concept. So let me show you how, if I was watching this video, the topics one to four, how I'd use Scrintle to then connect all of this information together. So I've started off by creating this card to show that it's revision for topics one to four, and then I've linked it to these separate boxes on my board for topics one, two, three, and four, and given the name of those modules. What I can now do as I'm watching the video is for topic one, pick out the key concepts that come up, as you can see I'm doing here. And then I can do the same thing for topics two, topic three, and topic four. And if I can see any way that information links together between those, I could do another line showing how they connect. The other thing that I really like about this is color coding. And I love having really neat, organized notes, but also I want them to be effective. And the reason I like like the color coding for this is you can use the colors to represent something. So in this case, I'm using it to represent the different topics, but you could maybe have it to represent running themes. So it could be you might want to pick a color that represents chemical bonds or colors that represent animals, plants, whatever your theme might be to try and understand connections better. So if you want to give Scrintle a go while you're watching these videos, then click the link below. And you also get a special discount if you use Teach 10 when you sign up. And that discount will give 10% off. It is only valid for four weeks though after this video went live. So if you're ready to convert all of your creative ideas, revision into structured knowledge in a way that's gonna really Really help you to remember the key facts give it a go so let's jump into then all the information you need to know for Cambridge International A level for topics one to four and we're going to be going through one to four which is cell structure biological molecules enzymes and cell membranes and transport start with cell structure which is split into these two subsections the microscope in the cell studies and cells are the basic units of living organisms so we're starting with microscopes and there are three types of microscopes that you need to be aware of light microscopes and then there are two electron microscopes Light microscopes have a poor resolution, or at least it's poorer in comparison to an electron microscope. And that is because the resolution is determined by the wavelength of the light. And wavelength of visible light is longer than the wavelength of an electron. An advantage of light microscopes compared to the electron microscopes, though, is you can view living samples, which isn't possible with electron microscopes. And also you do get color images without having to artificially add in color to a photo afterwards. So then if we have a look at the first type of electron microscope, Electron microscopes do have higher magnification and higher resolution, and that's because the electrons, which are used to create the image, have a shorter wavelength compared to visible light. The way the image is created is the electrons pass through the specimen. That's why it's called transmission, because the electrons are transmitting through the specimen, and they'll absorb different amounts of electrons, and that's how you get the different shades of gray to create the image. 
So a transmission electron microscope will enable you to see the internal structures of organelles. Scanning electron microscopes also have a higher magnification and resolution because they are creating these images with electrons which have a shorter wavelength compared to visible light. But this time you get a 3D image which shows you the contours on the outside. And that's because the electrons will bounce off the surface and the way that they are reflecting is what creates that 3D image. So we've talked about resolution and magnification a little bit, but we haven't actually defined what they mean yet. So resolution is the minimum distance between two objects in which they can still be viewed as separate. So that is your key definition to learn. You could turn that into a flashcard. And with optical microscopes, that resolution is determined by the length of the wavelength of light. And as we said, electron microscopes is determined by the wavelength of an electron, which is shorter than for visible light, which is why electron microscopes have a higher resolution. The term magnification refers to how many times larger the image that you're viewing is compared to the actual object. And that's a formula that we'll be going through shortly as well. So to work out the magnification, you would do the size of the image that you're looking at divided by the size of the real object. So for example, if you wanted to know the magnification of this image, you'd need to use a ruler to measure the length of a cell. And then you would have to know the length of that actual cell as well. So in an exam question, they would have to tell you the actual length. You would then have to use your ruler to measure the image size. But it's key that you have them in the same units because cells are often measured in micrometers, whereas you'll be measuring in millimeters. So here's a little conversion, which again, you might find helpful to put onto a flashcard because it's letting you know if you wanted to convert millimeters into micrometers, you would need to times by a thousand. And if you wanted to convert micrometers back into millimeters, you'd need to divide by a thousand. So make sure you have these in the same units and then that would give you your magnification. Sometimes you might have to work out the size of the real object and in which case you'd rearrange this formula and that would then be size of image divided by magnification. You might also have to do scientific drawings. This is one of the skills. And this is when you are taking observation of structures from under the microscope and representing it as a scientific drawing. And there's a few key features that you need to know about scientific drawings. I do actually have an entire video on scientific drawings, which I'll link up here that you can watch. But this is in summary what you would need to make sure you are following in terms of the rules. It should be drawn in pencil. You should have a title uh, for the diagram and indicate what the specimen is within that title. If the magnification is known, which hopefully it is because you're doing it on a microscope, then you should state the magnification. You should always annotate the cell components, the cell sections, any tissues visible just to show what you are visualizing. There shouldn't be any sketches. And what that means is um, you should only use solid lines, no overlapping lines. It's not an artistic drawing. It's a very factual drawing to showing shape, proportion, location. And there shouldn't be any color or shading in either. So that's the whole aim of the scientific drawing, showing the size, location and proportion. Now, you might have to use an eyepiece graticule as well to be able to measure the actual size of the object that you're viewing under the microscope. And to do this, you need to calibrate your eyepiece graticule using a stage micrometer. So inside the light microscope, there is a scale on a glass disc, which is inside of the microscope. And that is called the eyepiece graticule. So it's within the eyepiece which is the long part that you look down and you use this to measure the size of objects you're viewing under the microscope. But as I said, you need to calibrate it each time because as you're looking at this scale in the eyepiece, you need to know what each one of these divisions is worth at each magnification. So you'd place a micrometer, a stage micrometer within your view to calibrate it. So let's go through how you'd actually calibrate it then. So step one is you need to line up your stage micrometer, which is the ruler that you would put on the stage of the microscope. Line that up with the ruler, which is the eyepiece graticule, which is already within the microscope. 
So that means when you look through your eyepiece, you should now see two rulers and they are lined up. So we've got our eyepiece graticule lined up with the stage micrometer. And what you then need to do is count how many divisions on the eyepiece graticule fit into one division on the stage micrometer. And the divisions on the micrometer are known distances. So each division on the micrometer is 10 micrometers. So this can then be used to calculate what one division on the eyepiece graticule is worth at that current magnification. So for example here, one division on the micrometer is 10 micrometers. And we can see here that two divisions fit into one of those stage micrometers. So this top one is the eyepiece graticule, the bottom one is the stage micrometer. We know that one division is worth 10 micrometers. Two eyepiece graticule divisions fit into that. So we do 10 divided by two, which gives five micrometers. So that means at this magnification, one division on the eyepiece graticule is worth five micrometers. And you would then take away the stage micrometer ruler, and then you'd put in your slide, and you can then measure cells using your eyepiece graticule when you now know what each division is worth and measure the actual size of the images that you are viewing. Then we go on to the electron microscopes in a bit more detail. So a beam of electrons is what is creating the image and they have a very short wavelength and that is why you have a high resolution and because the resolution is so high that means small organelles and internal structures can be viewed. The image is created by condensing that beam of electrons into a really fine beam and that is using an electromagnet. That is what focuses the beam of those negatively charged electrons. Now, electrons are absorbed by air, and this is why when you're using an electron microscope, it has to be a vacuum, so there's no air present. You've just got your specimen there. And for that reason, you can't view living specimens, because if it's a vacuum, that's going to cause the specimen to die. So you can't use living specimens, which is a downside. Um, and also, you only get black and white images, and you have to stain the sample. Now we did talk about some differences between the transmission and the electron microscope. We're going to go into it in a bit more detail. For a transmission electron microscope, because the electrons are transmitting or passing through the specimen, that means the specimen has to be sliced extremely thin and you'd need to stain it as well, then you put it in a vacuum. The electron gun will then be fired at the specimen to produce a beam of electrons that is then going to be focused using the electromagnet and some parts of the specimen absorb the electrons and that is why they appear darker on your image. So you end up with a 2D image like this one where you can see the internal structures of an organelle and this here is showing you the internal structure of a mitochondria. The scanning electron microscopes don't need to be as thin because the electrons aren't passing through, they are instead reflecting and scattering off the surface. And because they're scattering off the surface, that's how you get these different contours and therefore this 3D image of the surface of your specimen. So that's what you need to know about microscopes. The next part of cell structure is knowing this part 1.2, cells are the basic units of living organisms. So here is an extensive list of all of the organelles you need to know about in eukaryotic cells. And you need to know the structure and the function of these. And I've split it into the top part is what you'll find in animals and plants. The bottom ones that are highlighted in green, you'd only find in plant cells. So let's go through the structure and function of each of these. One thing you could be asked to do as well is to identify the organelles within a cell. So here we have an image which is showing us an animal cell. The cell membrane is that outer layer. We do have a vacuole labelled here, but animal cells don't have permanent vacuoles. They can have temporary vacuoles. So for example, a phagocyte, which is the white blood cells that engulf pathogens, they trap the pathogen after it's been engulfed inside of a phagosome, which is a temporary vacuole. We then can see here our rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we can see those folded cystinate with the ribosomes on the outside. 
The Golgi apparatus does look very similar to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, but the key difference is the Golgi apparatus curves. So it looks more like, um, often people tell me it looks like a Wi-Fi symbol. So you can see it curves a bit more. And often you'll see vesicles budding off the edges as well. That's how to tell apart the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. Ribosomes are very, very small. So you're looking for very small spheres. Lysosomes are larger than the ribosomes. Mitochondria, you have these inner foldings, which helps those to be identified as well. Then if we have a look at the plant cell, so all of the same organelles plus some extra. So we've got the chloroplasts, which do look similar to mitochondria because they've got these inner foldings as well. We've got a permanent vacuole and the membrane on the outside of that is called the tonoplast. And then in the cell wall, that's an extra layer on the outside and the pores in the cell wall are the plasma desmata. But let's go through each of those structures, looking at the structure and function in more detail. Starting with the cell surface membrane. Cell surface membranes are found in all cells and it's made up of this phospholipid bilayer, meaning you've got two layers of phospholipid where you have the hydrophilic heads on the outside and the hydrophobic tails pointing inwards. You have molecules embedded within that as well, which are typically proteins and cholesterol. The proteins could be these protein channels, which enable molecules to pass through, or protein carriers, which also allow molecules to pass through. You also get glycoproteins, which is where you have a protein embedded within it and a carbohydrate attached, or you can get as well other molecules such as a glycolipid, which is where you have a carbohydrate attached to the phospholipid. And those roles for those two molecules are often things like receptors. So the function of the plasma membrane we'll learn more about in the topic, which is looking at membranes and controlling what can enter and exit. But that is what the role is. It can control what can pass through the membrane, meaning what can enter and exit a cell. Next, then we look at the structure and function of the nucleus. So the nucleus is a membrane bound organelle and that membrane is the nuclear envelope, which we can see here. There are pores, which are tiny holes within that nuclear envelope. And that's how mRNA, which is created inside of the nucleus, is able to leave the nucleus to go to the cytoplasm. Inside of the nucleus, there is nucleoplasm, which is a granular jelly like material. It's also where you find the chromosomes and in eukaryotic organisms, chromosomes are protein bound. So they're attached to histone proteins and we describe the shape as linear. You have inside of the nucleus as well, a nucleolus, which is the smaller sphere inside. And that is where RNA, specifically rRNA is made and rRNA is used to make ribosomes. So the function then is the site of DNA replication. It's also the site of transcription, which is the first stage in protein synthesis, which results in the creation of mRNA. It's also the site of rRNA production and ribosome synthesis, and it contains the genetic code for each cell. Flagella is the next structure, and this is a whip-like structure we can see here, and this will spin round at the base using a motor, and as it spins, it enables movement. Now you don't have this on every single cell, but one example of a cell that would have it is a sperm cell, for example. Cilia, again, aren't on all cells, but some cells do have cilia, and these are hair-like projections coming out of the cell. Now these cilia can be mobile or stationary. Mobile cilia help move substances in a sweeping motion. So the cells lining your trachea, which is part of your um, breathing system connecting to your lungs have cilia and they are mobile cilia to sweep and move mucus up and out of the trachea so it's to prevent lung infection basically. Stationary cilia are important in sensory organs as well so for example in the nose. Microvilli again aren't on every single cell but some cells do have microvilli and these are folding in the cell surface membrane to create these finger-like projections. And the function of this is it increases the surface area for transport across the membrane. So for example, the epithelial cells lining the ileum have microvilli 
and that increases the surface area to maximize the absorption of molecules like glucose and amino acids after digestion. Also within the proximal convoluted tubule in the nephron of the kidney, there are microvilli to increase the surface area to maximize the reabsorption of glucose. Centrioles and microtubules are the next organelles we're going to have a look at. And centrioles are made up of microtubules. And they occur in these pairs to form what's known as a centrosome. The function is to produce or they're involved in the production of spindle fibers which are released to organize the chromosomes into particular positions during cell division. The microtubules in particular also aid with the movement of cilia and flagella. The cytoskeleton is the next one and this is a network of fibers found within the cytoplasm all over a cell. And it consists of microfilaments, microtubules and intermediate fibres, which we can see here. The function is it provides mechanical strength to cells. It helps to maintain the shape and stability of a cell. And many organelles are bound to the cytoskeleton also. So we can see that here, that organelles are actually attached to this cytoskeleton. The microfilaments within it are responsible for cell movement. The microtubules are responsible for creating a scaffold-like structure. And then the intermediate fibres provide some mechanical strength. Next then we have a look at the endoplasmic reticulum. And you have rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Both have folded membranes which are known as cystinae. And we can see those here. The difference then is the rough have ribosomes attached on the outside. And therefore, the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is protein synthesis because it's got these ribosomes on the outside. And the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, their function is to synthesize and store lipids and carbohydrates. The Golgi apparatus, which is shown here in this peachy orange color, again, it's made up of folded membranes, which are known as cystine, but it's more of a curved shape. And you also get these secretory vesicles that pinch off. And that is because anything that's been processed and packaged within the Golgi apparatus is then secreted out in these vesicles. So within that Golgi apparatus, the functions are you'll have carbohydrates being added to proteins to form glycoproteins. They might produce secretory enzymes. They're going to secrete carbohydrates, transport, modify and store lipids. They might form lysosomes. Molecules are labeled for their destination here as well. And they get sent off in those secretory vesicles. And that's how the finished products are transported in these vesicles, which then fuse with the cell surface membrane, which then means they're released from the cell. Lysosomes are our next organelle. Lysosomes are the next organelle, and these are bags of digestive enzymes, and they can contain 50 different digestive enzymes. So they will hydrolyze phagocytic cells. That's one example of a lysosome that you learn about in phagocytes. They can completely break down dead cells, which is known as autolysis. You also get exocytosis, which is where they can release enzymes to the outside of the cell to destroy material and they can digest worn out organelles for reuse of materials as well. Next then we have a look at the mitochondria and this is a double membrane bound organelle. The inner membrane is highly folded and we call it the Christi. Inside of that we have a fluid center called the mitochondrial matrix and that contains ribosomes, the smaller ones which are 70S and it also contains loops of DNA so that it can create its own enzymes. So this is the site of aerobic respiration, therefore the site of lots of ATP being produced. And as I already said, it has DNA, so it can code for its own enzymes required for respiration. Ribosomes are our next organelle, and these are made up of two subunits. We have a large and a small subunit. A ribosome is made up of protein and rRNA. And there are two types of ribosomes. ATS are the larger ribosomes found in eukaryotic organisms. 70S ribosomes are the smaller ones that prokaryotic cells have, but it's also the ribosomes that you find in the mitochondria and chloroplasts of eukaryotic organisms. And the function is it's the site of protein synthesis. We then move on to the organelles that are just found in plants. 
So chloroplasts, this is another double membrane bound organelle. And then inside we have these folded membranes. So this is your thylakoid membrane, which is highly folded to create these stacks that look a bit like stacked up coins. And those stacks are known as the grana. And they are embedded, those membranes are embedded with lots of pigments and proteins which are needed for the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis. In peach colour here, that is a fluid centre, which is known as the stroma, which contains lots of enzymes that are needed for the light independent reactions of photosynthesis. So that's the function of this organelle, it's the site of photosynthesis. The cell wall is found in plant cells, but also fungi. Fungi are also eukaryotic organisms. You do have cell walls in prokaryotic organisms as well, but we're just going to focus on cell walls of the eukaryotic organisms for now. So plants have a cell wall made up of cellulose, whereas fungi have a cell wall made up of chitin, which is a nitrogen containing polysaccharide. And the function of the cell wall is to provide structural strength. Plant cells also have a large permanent vacuole, and this is a single membrane bound sac. For example, we've got the phagocytic vacuoles in animals, but those are temporary, and we're just focusing on the permanent vacuoles in plants. And those have a tonoplast, that's the name of the membrane that surrounds them. The plant vacuole's function is to regulate osmosis, and also it contains the pigments which give flowers their colour, so it's going to attract pollinators. The plasma desmata is the next structure, and these are pore-like channels within the cell wall, which we can see here, and that provides a channel between cells to enable the movement of water and dissolved mineral ions between cells. So we then go on to photomicrographs, which is how you can identify these different organelles from images taken under the microscope. And a photomicrograph is an image that's been captured by a light microscope, they offer a lower resolution because of everything we said about the microscopes. So the light microscope, the image is created using light, which has a longer wavelength of light. But what you can work out from this is in plant cells, you might be able to identify features such as the cell membrane, chloroplasts and the vacuole. In animal cells, you'll be able to see key structures like the cell membrane, nucleus and cytoplasm. But to be able to see other small organelles and the internal structure of organelles, that's when you'd need to use your electron micrograph or an electron microscope to create an electron micrograph. That's the name of the image that is created using an electron microscope. And because those microscopes have a higher resolution, that's why you're able to see all of these extra organelles and also the internal structures of those organelles. So if we move on to prokaryotic cells next then, and look at the key differences between the prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So first of all, prokaryotic cells are much smaller. So typically they're one to five micrometers in diameter. They don't contain any membrane bound organelles. They do have ribosomes, but it's the 70S smaller ones. They contain DNA, but not within the nucleus. They do have a cell wall, but it's made of a molecule called murine. Some prokaryotic cells also contain plasmids, a slime capsule around the outside and flagella, but they don't all contain those. So let's have a look then at those differences. They don't contain any membrane bound organelles. So that means they don't have any mitochondria, chloroplasts, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, but they will have circular DNA loose within the cytosol, which is the name of the cytoplasm. They do have ribosomes, as we said, but it's the smaller 70S ribosomes. They don't have a nucleus. Instead, their DNA is circular and is loose within that cytoplasm. We did say some of them contain plasmids, and plasmids are small loops of DNA which only carry a few genes. And you can get varying numbers of these in your prokaryotic cells, which are typically bacteria. The cell wall, we said they do have, but it's made of a glycoprotein called murine. 
And that slime capsule, the capsule on the outside of the cell wall that is only sometimes there, it's made of a protein and the function is it prevents the bacteria from drying out or desiccating. And it also helps to protect the bacteria against the host's immune system because it will help to partially cover the antigens. The flagella, again, that's only sometimes present on bacteria. That can rotate and it helps to make the bacteria move. So this would be a good table to copy down to have in your revision to compare the structures that you'd find in a prokaryotic organism and eukaryotic organisms, but also split into the plants and animals. Lastly, then, it's known about viruses and viruses are non-living and non-cellular. So we often describe them as virus particles. So they are even smaller than bacteria and they only contain a nucleic acid core, which could be DNA or RNA, a capsid, and make sure you do not confuse this with the capsule that's found on some prokaryotic organisms, because the capsid is this part here that surrounds the nucleic acid core, this protein layer. On the outside, there are attachment proteins, which are used to attach to receptors on the host cell. And then some of them have an outer envelope made up of lipids, which would be phospholipids. Viral replication occurs inside of host cells and it involves the injection of that nucleic acid into the cell. And bacteriophage are an example of a virus that can infect bacteria. Next then we move on to the topic biological molecules, which is split into these four components. And we're gonna start with testing for biological molecules. So the first biological molecule that we're gonna look at for testing is starch. And this one's quite straightforward. You would add the chemical iodine, which is an orangey brown color. And if starch is present, it goes blue black. The next then is to test for reducing sugars. And there's a bit more to it for this one. First of all, you need to add Benedict's reagent, which is this blue color. But for this one, if you don't heat it up, the reaction won't happen. So the mark schemes will be really specific that you have to say add Benedict's reagent and heat. After heating, a positive test result will mean that that blue color will change to one of these colors. And the more red it is, the higher the concentration of sugar present. So here we can see this orangey color. So that'd be a medium high concentration of reducing sugar present. You can also use reagent test strips and those can be used to test for the presence and concentration of reducing sugars. Then the test for a non-reducing sugar, so for example, sucrose, you would still have to do your Benedict's test to start with. And if your sample remained blue, then you move on to the next stages, but there's still a mark for saying following a negative Benedict's test. You would then add acid and boil, and it does have to be boiling hot so that you can hydrolyze sucrose into fructose and glucose. So you'd have to say boil. You then need to cool the solution and add an alkali to neutralize. And then you would add Benedict's reagent and heat, and then you should get a color change if a non-reducing sugar was present. And it will go, it says here blue to green, yellow, orange, or brick red, but typically it actually goes orange or brick red because if you're testing and you do have a reducing sugar, because you've hydrolyzed that disaccharide into monosaccharides, you've doubled the concentration of sugars present. So it should go brick red. Then we've got the semi-quantitative Benedict's test. So you'd prepare your Benedict's reagent and you would then add this to a known concentration of glucose and note down the time it takes for that color change to occur. So to prepare the sample, you could dilute the reducing sugar solution to a known volume of distilled water. So you can link this to the skill of serial dilutions to create a series of different concentrations, known concentrations of glucose. And for each one, you'd perform the Benedict's test, time how long it takes for each of those concentrations to change color. And then you'd note that down. And if you plotted that as a graph, the time taken for each one to change color, then it is semi-quantitative. The test for proteins then would be adding bi -uret. And the reason I've split it up into bi -u -ret is to try and help you remember the spelling, because often students get this confused with buret, which is a piece of apparatus you use in chemistry for titrations. And the spelling does matter, bi -uret. 
and that is this pale blue color. You would add that to your sample. You do not need to heat. And if there is protein present, it turns this purple lilac color. Then we have the test for lipids. The first step would be you need to dissolve your sample in ethanol. And to do that, you would add ethanol and shake. Once you've done that, then you would add distilled water. And if you have a lipid present, you'd get this white emulsion. And you do have to state the color, which is white. And emulsion is the description of the fact that you've got this thicker substance. It's not a precipitate, but it's what we call an emulsion. Next then, we move on to carbohydrates and lipids. So you need to know the difference between a monomer and a polymer. So monomers are smaller units which can bond together to create larger molecules. And a polymer is made from lots of monomers bonded together. And you need to know about the following monomers and polymers. So we're going to go through those. But you also need to know about macromolecules. And those are giant molecules. There are three that you need to know. Polysaccharides, which are the top three listed here. Proteins. And then the polynucleotides, which form in DNA and RNA. So if we have a look at the carbohydrates, first of all, carbohydrates are made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and they can be categorized into monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides. Mono means one, saccharide means sugar. So a monosaccharide is the monomer. That's when you just have one sugar unit. A disaccharide is a dimer, which means two units joined together. And di means two, saccharide means sugar. So it's two sugars joined together. Polysaccharides are the polymers. Poly meaning many, or in this case, it literally means more than two. And that's when you have many sugar units bonded together. And here are some examples of each of those that you need to know. So if we have a look at glucose, alpha glucose to start with, this is the key monosaccharide that you will learn about glucose. And the formula is C6H12O6. And here we have alpha glucose, the structure that you would need to know. Glucose has two isomers though, which means two forms of glucose that have the same molecular formula, but a different structure. And we can see here we've got alpha glucose on the left, and on the right, we have beta glucose. And the key difference is alpha glucose, I always think it's pretty much symmetrical. You've got hydrogen on top and the hydroxyl on the bottom. That's the same on this side over here. Whereas for beta glucose, you have the hydroxyl on top and the hydrogen on the bottom. And that slight change in the position of the hydrogen and the hydroxyl has a big impact on the location and the type of bonds that can form when creating the polysaccharides and therefore the final shape of the polysaccharides. So monosaccharides, these can be categorized according to how many carbon atoms they contain. A hexo sugar, hex means six, and wherever you see O-S-E at the end, that means it is a sugar. So hexos means it's a sugar that contains six carbons. Pentose means it's a sugar that contains five carbons. For example, ribose. The disaccharides, these are made of two monosaccharides bonded together with a glycosidic bond. They're formed via a condensation reaction. And the key ones that you need to know are these here. Maltose, lactose and sucrose. All three of them contain glucose as one of the monosaccharides, but it's the second monosaccharide that differs. So maltose contains two molecules of glucose. Lactose contains glucose and galactose. And the way I always remember that is there's lactose within the name. And then sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. So when you join those together, because it's a condensation reaction, you form a bond between those molecules and that also involves the removal of water, which is why we've got plus water for all of those. So we said it's a condensation reaction that forms them. A condensation reaction is when you join two molecules together by removing water and that forms a chemical bond. Hydrolysis is the opposite reaction. It's when you split apart molecules through the addition of water, which breaks a chemical bond. And we see these two reactions creating 
all of the polymers and also hydrolyzing the polymers back into their monomers. So here it is in action. We're just showing um, glucose, but without any of the hydrogen or hydroxyl groups, except for the ones involved in the condensation reaction. So here we have two molecules of glucose and the water is going to be removed from these hydroxyl groups. It doesn't actually matter which way round the full hydroxyl and then the single hydrogen is removed from. The point is you're left with a single oxygen atom behind. And that is what the glycosidic bond is, the carbon to oxygen to carbon. So that's the bond that is formed to join these two molecules together and it involved the removal of water. And we'd call that a one to four glycosidic bond because the bond is formed between carbon one and carbon four. And we always number the carbons going clockwise from the oxygen in the ring. So carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So the bond is formed between carbon one on this glucose molecule and carbon four on this glucose molecule. A hydrolysis reaction then would involve adding that water back in to break that glycosidic bond and then we'd get those two hydroxyl groups back and we now have our monosaccharides again. So the polysaccharides, these are created by repeated condensation reactions between many glucose monomers. Starch is found in plants and its function is a store of glucose. Cellulose is also found in plants and that is a structural molecule, so it provides structural strength to the cell wall. And glycogen is found in animals, it's also a store of glucose. So glycogen and starch are very similar in structure because they have the same function, it's just one is found in plants, one is found in animals. So here is the summary table. This would be a good one to screenshot and print out or to write it out so you've got your summary of the structure and function of all three of those polysaccharides. So the first one we've got is which isomer of glucose the monomer is in all three. So starch and glycogen both have alpha glucose, whereas cellulose has beta glucose. And it's that key difference which explains why cellulose can only form one to four glycosidic bonds, whereas alpha glucose enables the formation of one to six glycosidic bonds as well. And when you have a one to six glycosidic bond, that causes a branch to come off the structure. And that is why starch and glycogen, if we jump to the structure part, they both are branched molecules. Now that is an advantage for starch and glycogen because the fact that they are branched means that there is a greater surface area to these molecules. So therefore, when enzymes attach to hydrolyze that store of glucose back into glucose, they can more rapidly hydrolyze that molecule. And that's good because it means you get the glucose being released for respiration more rapidly. All three molecules are very large, so they're insoluble, which means they won't dissolve, won't affect the water potential or osmosis in the cell. Cellulose is a very different structure. This is the one that we said is made of beta glucose. One to four glycosidic bonds joins them together, and that means you don't have any branches. You just get these long, straight chains of the polymer, which can therefore lie really closely together in parallel, and hydrogen bonds then form between these chains. And the fact that so many hydrogen bonds form between them is what provides this structural strength to the molecule. A single hydrogen bond is actually very weak, but because there are so many, holding together your chains of beta glucose, which is then called a fibril or a microfibril or a macrofibril, that is what provides the structural strength. The lipids was the other part of this submodule, and these are macromolecules, but they are not polymers. You do not have repeated units bonded together. So it is still large, but it's not a polymer. They're non-polar molecules, and for that reason, they're insoluble in water, and they will only dissolve in organic solvents, such as ethanol. They are hydrophobic, which means they will repel or they won't interact with water. And they're made up of three fatty acids for a triglyceride and a glycerol molecule. And for a phospholipid, it's two fatty acids and a glycerol plus that phosphate group. But what they all have in common is they're made up of glycerol and fatty acids. So these are the two key lipids that you will need to know the structure of. And the main difference is that a phospholipid 
has only two fatty acids. So instead of that third fatty acid, it's got a phosphate group attached to the glycerol. And that completely changes the properties of the lipid. So how a triglyceride is made is actually the same way that phospholipid is made. Your glycerol and fatty acids join together through condensation reactions, which we said was the joining together of molecules, forming a chemical bond, removing water. And it's at this point here between the glycerol and the fatty acids that the water molecule would be removed. And if it's a triglyceride, you have three condensation reactions, so three molecules of water are removed. And we then get three bonds, and those bonds are known as ester bonds. And that is an R, your R group here is the fatty acid hydrocarbon chain. And then we've got the C double bond O, O, um, and the H is over here. So that would be your ester bond. This is just showing you in more detail how that condensation reaction happens between the glycerol and those fatty acids. So you'd have a molecule of water being removed. And that then leaves you with the triglyceride and your ester bond. And three molecules of water would be removed. Now, the fatty acids can either be saturated or unsaturated. And what we mean by that is whether they contain a single or double bond between the carbon atoms in the R group, which is that hydrocarbon chain. So this top one, we can see only single bonds between the carbon atoms. So that would mean it's saturated because it's holding the maximum number of hydrogens possible. That's why it's saturated. An unsaturated fatty acid, you have at least one double bond between the carbon atoms. So it's not fully saturated. It could have held two more hydrogens here. And where you do get that double bond between the carbons, it causes a kink in the chain. We can see here it's bending. So the properties then of triglycerides, they can transfer energy. And that's because of the large ratio of energy storing carbon to hydrogen bonds compared to the number of carbon atoms. A lot of energy can be transferred when it's broken down. Also, due to the high ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms, they can act as a metabolic water source. And this is because triglycerides can release water if they are oxidized. And that's essential for animals such as camels in the desert. Also, because the lipids are large, they're hydrophobic molecules, which means they're insoluble. So they're not going to affect the water potential or osmosis. They also have a relatively low mass. And that means compared to other molecules of their size, such as a protein, they do not have anywhere near as high a mass. So you can actually store a lot of them in an animal without increasing the mass as much, which would prevent movement. Phospholipids, on the other hand, so we've talked about the fact that those are made of a glycerol molecule, two fatty acid chains and a phosphate group. That means that they would only require two condensation reactions to join those fatty acids on and you get two ester bonds. The properties are different, though, because of the phosphate group on what we describe as the head of the phospholipid. So the head is the glycerol and the phosphate group. And the phosphate group has got a negative charge to it. And because it's got a negative charge, that changes the properties and it makes it hydrophilic, which means it can interact with water. The tail is the hydrocarbon chains or those fatty acid chains, and those don't have a charge. So they are hydrophobic, which means they will repel water, but they can interact and mix with lipids or fats. And for that reason, you get this phospholipid bilayer structure forming with lots of phospholipids. And that's because those hydrophilic heads can interact with water, but the tails are repelled by water. So if you were then to put large amounts of phospholipid in water, you will get the heads on the outside interacting with the water and the tails spin inwards, repelling away. So this behavior of the tails moving away from water is what results in that phospholipid bilayer, which forms the plasma membrane around cells and some organelles. And the hydrophilic nature of the phosphate head enables that surface of the plasma membrane to stay in place. And the phospholipid bilayer arrangement enables carbohydrates also to attach and form important receptors on the membrane. And that would be your glycolipids. So next then we're going to move on to the proteins. 
So proteins are made up of one or more large polymers creating a macromolecule. And the monomer that they're made up of are amino acids. So here is your general structure of an amino acid. You have NH2, which is the amine or amino group. You have your carboxyl group, which is COOH. You have a central carbon, and then we have an R group, which is the bit different on all 20 amino acids. So R means it's variable. And then you have a hydrogen. So the way that I always remember how to draw it is, remember you have this central carbon in the middle with four different groups coming off it. Then you have to try and remember the groups, your amine group, carboxyl group, R and hydrogen. So proteins are polymers, they're these macromolecules made up of the monomer amino acids. And there are four levels of structural organization. And we're gonna describe each of these, starting with the primary structure. So straight after protein synthesis, you have your primary structure, which is just a sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. And you have to say either the sequence or the order because that exact order of the amino acids is going to determine the bonding location that happens in the later stages. So it is the order or the sequence of amino acids held together by peptide bonds. That primary structure then folds or coils to make either a beta pleated sheet or an alpha helix. And those are held in place by hydrogen bonds. So describing the structure of the secondary structure of a protein would be a two mark question. The first mark would be for saying that you get these alpha helixes or beta pleated sheets. Second mark is saying they held in place by hydrogen bonds. The location of those hydrogen bonds then is between different amino acids and it's always between a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom. Next then we have the tertiary structure and this is the further folding and it's held in place by a range of different bonds. You have hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions, which are quite weak. You have even more hydrogen bonds, which are also weak, but then you'll have ionic bonds, which are slightly stronger. And the ionic and disulfide bonds, the disulfide bonds being the strongest of them, the covalent bonds, those are gonna form between the R groups of different amino acids within the polypeptide chain. Now you actually only sometimes get disulfide bonds because disulfide means it's a bond between two sulfur atoms. And that means you're only going to get this bond if you have the R group, which contains sulfur, because sulfur is not in the rest of the general structure. So that tertiary structure then, it's the further folding to create a unique 3D shape held in place by those bonds. So it'd be a three mark definition. The further folding is one mark, unique 3D shape is a second, and naming the bonds is the third. And the location that those bonds form is determined by the sequence of amino acids in the primary structure. And where those bonds form is what determines the final unique 3D shape. So that's why the primary structure is so important. That sequence of amino acids determines the location of these tertiary structure bonds and that determines how it folds and the 3D shape it makes. The last level of organization is a quaternary structure. So some proteins, not all, are made up of more than one polypeptide chain. So you still get that 3D unique shape of the tertiary structure, it's just you have multiple polypeptide chains bonded together. So for example, hemoglobin is made up of four polypeptide chains and hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains. Each chain has a prosthetic group attached, which means a non-protein group attached to the polypeptide chain. And that prosthetic group contains iron. So the group is called a heme group and it contains ion. So we then have a look at fibrous versus globular proteins. So we've talked about the fact that the tertiary structure is this 3D unique shape because of that um, further folding. But the way it folds, you can either get spherical shapes, which would result in globular proteins, or more rope-like shapes, which would be your fibrous proteins. 
So the fibrous proteins, that is when it folds to create these long twisted strands. And because of that, it creates a really stable structure, which is insoluble in water. And the function would be to give structural strength. So collagen, for example, in bones or keratin in your hair. In contrast, the globular proteins, they fold up into these sphere-like shapes, which means they're relatively unstable. They are soluble and they are involved in physiological functions. So, for example, all the enzymes, antibodies and some hormones and haemoglobin. But because they're relatively unstable, these are all very temperature and pH sensitive. So let's have a look at haemoglobin in a bit more detail. We said it's a globular protein. It also has a quaternary structure. It's got four polypeptide chains, two that are called alpha chains and two that are called beta chains. It has a prosthetic group attached to it, and that is the heme group, which we can see here. Um, it's described as a conjugated protein. Conjugated means it has a prosthetic group added to it. And that prosthetic group is the heme group, which contains iron. And it's the iron that the oxygen is going to be able to bind to. Collagen was our example of a fibrous protein. So collagen molecules are triple helices composed of three polypeptide chains wound around each other, like we can see in this diagram here. And these chains are held together by hydrogen bonds and some covalent bonds. The fibril formation then is that the collagen molecules interact with the adjacent molecules next to them and that's going to form these cross links between their R groups and they can then align in parallel. We get these staggered ends which prevent weak spots in the fibril. So overall it creates a tensile strength. So collagen's unique structure provides both flexibility but also tensile strength. So tissues like your Achilles tendon in your ankle is rich in collagen fibers, so it can withstand significant pulling force without stretching or breaking. And the collagen fibers can align differently based on the forces they encounter. In tendons, they form parallel bundles along the direction of the tension. In skin, layers of collagen fibers run in various directions to resist the pulling force from multiple angles. So the final biological molecule is water. So water is a polar molecule due to the uneven distribution of charge. So you have two hydrogen atoms and oxygen. The oxygen has a slight negative charge. The hydrogen atoms have a slight positive charge. So that's what this delta negative and delta positive symbol are representing. And that is going to enable hydrogen bonds to form between different water molecules and that's what we're shown here we've got hydrogen bond forming between the oxygen and the hydrogen of different water molecules and it's the formation of those hydrogen bonds that provide the properties that we're going to be talking about of water so the key properties that you need to know is that it's an important solvent in reactions it has a high specific heat capacity and a large latent heat of vaporization so if we start with the fact that it's a solvent, this is due to the polar nature of the molecule. Because the hydrogen atoms have a slight positive charge and the oxygen have a slight negative charge, that means that it can attract positive and negative ions when they're placed within the water. And that is what causes the dissolving because the water can surround those ions. So this could be sodium chloride, for example, in this example, and um, the sodium would be the positive, the chloride would be the negative. So the oxygen, which is a slight negative, would be attractive to the positive sodium. That can then separate that lattice and surround the sodium ions, and the hydrogen could do the same thing to the chloride ion. And as it separates all of those, that is what dissolving means. So it's possible because of that polar nature, but it can't dissolve non-polar molecules. And instead, non-polar molecules would actually repel the water. The cytosol in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells is mainly water though. So this is really beneficial because it means many solutes can dissolve within the cytoplasm of the cell and therefore reactions are gonna happen more rapidly. But also it means molecules can be easily transported, dissolved in the solution. 
So that links this idea of transport mediums as well. Because water is a good solvent, plants, for example, they will have mineral ions dissolved in the water, which is then transported up through the xylem. And not only that, because of the hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules, the water molecules stick together, creating cohesion. And that means water can move up the xylem in the transpiration stream as a continuous column of water. And that makes it much easier to draw the water up the xylem with all of those dissolved mineral ions within it so that the cells further up can gain access to both water and mineral ions. It's actually the same idea in blood, not that there is this co cohesion, but blood is made up of plasma, which is mainly water. And that means you can dissolve ions in it and glucose, and that can be easily transported around the blood in animals. Next then is the high specific heat capacity. And water has a high specific heat capacity because of the large number of hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules. And therefore it's going to require energy to break those hydrogen bonds to split apart the water molecules. And for that reason, a lot of energy is required to raise the temperature of water. So water acts as a temperature buffer. And this is an advantage as internal temperatures of plants and animals should therefore remain relatively constant, even if the external temperature is fluctuating. And that should prevent enzymes from denaturing. It's also particularly important for any organism that is aquatic, meaning it lives within bodies of water, because that should mean that the temperature of the body of water that they live in should remain relatively constant as well. Then we move on to the large latent heat of vaporization. This means that a lot of energy is required to convert water from its liquid state to its gaseous state. So in other words, for evaporation. And again, that's because of the energy required to break the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. And because a lot of energy is required to evaporate water, that means that it can provide a significant cooling effect. So when you sweat, water is being released onto the surface of your skin. The heat energy that's radiating from your skin is used to evaporate the water. And in doing that, large amounts of heat energy are being removed from your skin and it provides a cooling effect. Next, then we move on to module three, which is enzymes, split into these two, three topics. And we're going to be starting with mode of action of enzymes. So enzymes are an example of globular proteins and they are biological catalysts. The active site is specific and unique in shape due to the specific folding in that tertiary structure, which is determined by the primary structure and the location of the bonds in the tertiary structure. Due to this specific shape, they get an active site that is unique, which will be complementary in shape to only one substrate. So that means enzymes are specific, so they'll only catalyze one particular reaction. And that could be intracellular or extracellular reactions. So for example, catalase is an intracellular enzyme inside of liver cells that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water, whereas trypsin is an extracellular enzyme in the small intestines that hydrolyzes proteins. So if we think about how they are speeding up these chemical reactions, it's because all reactions require a certain amount of energy before they occur. And that is known as the activation energy, which you'll be familiar with from chemistry at GCSE. When enzymes attach to the substrates, they lower the activation energy needed for the reaction to occur, and therefore they speed up the reaction. So there's two models that hypothesize how they lower the activation energy. The lock and key model is the one that suggests that the enzyme is like a lock with a fixed shape and that the substrate is like a key, which is perfectly complementary in shape to that lock. So they fit together and you create an enzyme substrate complex um, and that will then result in the distortion of the substrate and lowering the activation energy. Now they'll only bind together because of random collisions. The difference between this and the induced fit model is, in this instance, it's more like the analogy that the enzyme is like a glove and the substrate is like your hand. So that means that they're not perfectly complementary to start with, but as soon as they bind together, like your hand going into the glove, they then become perfectly complementary. 
So what this means is the substrate is almost complementary in shape to the active site. When it collides, it induces the enzyme to mold around that substrate. And in doing that, it puts tension and strain on the bonds in the substrate and therefore less energy is needed to break those bonds. And that is how it lowers the activation energy. Now, this is the current accepted model because of research that's been done. They've realized that enzymes, proteins are slightly flexible. So this would make sense that that is the case. And also it better explains how the activation is lowered. The activation energy is lowered. You need to know a little bit about certain reactions. So investigating enzyme catalyzed reactions, starting with, let's have a look at the catalase reaction monitoring. So catalase, we already said, that's the enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide in the liver into water and oxygen. So you could be asked to investigate the progress of this reaction where you can measure the rate of formation of oxygen over time. So you could do this by collecting the oxygen produced in a measuring cylinder or maybe a gas syringe and at set intervals record the volume of oxygen being produced. Alternatively, you could use a data logger that's going to be a more accurate way to measure the oxygen being produced. But what you would then do is plot the volume or the pressure of oxygen produced against time and the graph can be generated to then visualize the rate of the reaction because rate is the amount of product produced over a set period of time. The amylase reaction monitoring is the alternative option. So amylase is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of starch, that's the substrate, into simpler sugars such as maltose, and then eventually maltase would hydrolyze that into glucose. To monitor the progress of this reaction, we can measure the rate of the disappearance of starch over time. And we'd need to use iodine for this. So you'd need to take samples of the reaction mixture at regular intervals and test for the presence of starch using iodine. As amylase would be hydrolyzing starch into maltose, once the starch is hydrolyzed, the iodine would no longer change blue black and instead it would remain orangey brown. So you could time how long it takes for the reaction to occur by seeing how long it takes for the starch to be broken down and therefore you don't get a blue black color anymore. And you could always use a colorimeter as a way to quantify this. So a colorimeter then is an instrument used to measure the absorbance or the transmittance of light by a solution, but it's normally the absorbance. It works on the principle that certain substances absorb light at specific wavelengths, and that results in a change in the intensity of the light that can be transmitted through the solution. Enzyme catalyzed reactions often involve color changes due to the formation of reaction products or the loss of a substrate. So you could measure this within a colorimeter. So you'd place your sample in a cuvette, which is the name of the plastic holder, put it into your colorimeter. You then press the test button and that will cause a beam of light to shine through your solution. And then you can see how much was absorbed by the solution versus gets transmitted and picked up by the detector. And that will then give you a numerical value. So you get a quantitative result. Next time we have a look at the factors that affect enzyme action. And the key factors that you need to know about are temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, and substrate concentration. Now the first two link back to what we were saying in the proteins part of this lesson, whereby enzymes are globular proteins and globular proteins are less stable and therefore they're sensitive to certain conditions, meaning that they are more at risk of having tertiary structure bonds being broken and therefore they lose their unique 3D shape. And that is what temperature and pH cause to happen. If there isn't a high enough temperature, enzymes don't denature, but at lower temperatures, there's insufficient kinetic energy for the successful collision between the enzyme and the substrate. And therefore you get fewer enzyme substrate complexes and the rate of reaction is lower. If you go above the optimum temperature though, there will now be so much kinetic energy that it causes the bonds, such as the hydrogen bonds, to break. And that results in the protein unraveling and losing its unique 3D shape. That means that active site changes shape and therefore enzyme substrate complexes can't form. And we'd say that the enzyme has denatured. 
It's a similar idea with pH, because if you have too high or too low a pH, it will interfere with the charges in the amino acids in the active site. And if you're changing the charges, that can cause the ionic and hydrogen bonds to break. That changes the tertiary structure and therefore changes the active site, and therefore the enzyme has denatured. So you won't get those enzyme substrate complexes, and therefore the rate of reaction is going to be lowered. Now, each enzyme will have a different optimal pH based on the location that they are functioning in. So most of them will be around neutral, but some are slightly more alkaline and some, for example, different protease enzymes that work in the stomach have an optimum significantly lower, maybe around pH one or two, so very acidic conditions. Next time we have a look at the substrate and enzyme concentration. This is nothing to do with denaturing now. It's all to do with successful collisions, whether there is an active site available or not. So if there is a low concentration of substrate, the reaction will be lower as there will be fewer collisions between the enzyme and substrates because they're less available. If you increase the substrate concentration, you'll therefore get an increase in the rate of reaction because at that point here on the graph, substrate is the limiting factor. But at high substrate concentrations, the rate of reaction plateaus because all of the enzyme active sites will already be in use. So even if you add more substrate, there are no empty active sites for them to collide with. So the reaction is already going at its maximum rate. With the enzyme concentration, similar idea. At low enzyme concentrations, there's going to be a lower rate of reaction because there'll be fewer collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, so fewer enzyme-substrate complexes. So as you increase the enzyme concentration, there'll be an increase in the rate of reaction. But at high enzyme concentrations, unless you also have unlimited substrate being added, the rate of reaction is going to plateau as there'll be insufficient substrates to bind with all of those enzymes. So you'll end up with some empty enzyme active sites. The next concept is inhibitors, which can prevent enzymes from working. A competitive inhibitor is one example, and these are the same or very similar in shape to the substrate, and therefore they're complementary to the active site, and they can actually bind to the active site, blocking it, and therefore preventing the substrate from binding. And if you have an enzyme inhibitor complex, that prevents an enzyme substrate complex and therefore it lowers the rate of reaction. Now, most competitive inhibitors are reversible. And what that means is if a high enough substrate concentration is present, then the substrate can actually knock the inhibitors out. And therefore you can get the enzyme substrate complexes forming and the rate of reaction will increase again. So reversible means the inhibitor can be removed. Non-reversible means the inhibitor cannot be removed. Non-competitive inhibitors are inhibitors that do not bind to the active site. They bind to a different binding site on the enzyme, which is known as the allosteric site. Now, this doesn't block the active site, but instead, when it does attach to the protein, it binds, it causes the protein to change shape, and therefore the active site changes shape, and the substrate will no longer be able to bind. So no matter how much extra substrate you add, you will not get any more enzyme substrate complexes because the active site changed. And that's why you get these shaped graphs with inhibitors. The solid line is showing you without any inhibitor, this is the curve that we just talked about showing the effect of adding the substrate. Um, eventually it plateaus, because all of the enzyme active sites are in use. Competitive inhibitors, the curve is shifted to the right, indicating a lower rate of reaction. But at high enough substrate concentrations, that would knock out the inhibitor, so you do end up at the same Vmax, which is the maximum rate of reaction for that enzyme reaction. Non-competitive inhibitors, though, there's a lower rate of reaction and it plateaus at a lower rate as well. And that's because it doesn't matter how much extra substrate you add, the rate won't increase because the active site has changed shape. Now, enzyme inhibitors, often what people think is, 
What is the point of an enzyme inhibitor? Now, sometimes they are just harmful. They are poisons, things like cyanide, for example. But some of them are actually very beneficial and naturally occur in our bodies. And it's this concept of end product inhibition. And what this means is the products of some reactions are actually reversible competitive inhibitors. And in that way, it controls when reactions are occurring to make sure cells don't overheat and that you're not wasting resources. Because if there's a lot of product present, that product acts as an inhibitor. So it will inhibit the enzyme at the start of a reaction. And therefore, it means the reaction isn't going to occur while you have lots of product present because you don't need that reaction to occur. But when that product gets used up, that means there'll be no more inhibitor present and the reaction will start again. So it's a way to control when reactions do and do not occur. So we saw on that graph this idea of Vmax, and Vmax refers to the maximum rate at which an enzyme catalyzes a reaction when the active sites of all enzyme molecules are fully saturated with the substrate. And at Vmax, the enzyme is functioning at its maximum capacity and further increases in substrate concentration won't increase the rate of reaction. So Vmax is a key measure used to characterize enzyme kinetics and is determined experimentally by plotting reaction rate against substrate concentration until you see that plateau being reached. You then got Michaela's Menten constant or Km and Km is a measure of the affinity of an enzyme for its substrate. It represents the substrate concentration at which the reaction rate is equal to half of the Vmax. So Km can be thought of as the substrate concentration required to achieve half maximum velocity. Enzymes with lower Km values have a higher affinity for their substrates as they reach half maximal velocity at lower substrate concentrations. So Km is derived from the michaelis mentum equation, which describes the relationship between reaction rate and substrate concentration. Lastly, then we have a look at this comparison of enzyme affinity. Km values can be used to compare the affinity of different enzymes for their substrates. Enzymes with lower Km values exhibit greater substrate affinity and are more efficient at converting substrate into product, even at low substrate concentrations. And conversely, enzymes with higher Km values have lower substrate affinity and require higher substrate concentrations to achieve maximal velocity. You also need to be aware of immobilized enzymes compared to enzymes free in solution. And enzymes can be immobilized, meaning fixed, within a matrix such as alginate, or they could be just free to move around within a solution. When investigating the difference in activity between immobilized and alginate or free in solution, experiments can be conducted comparing reaction rates under controlled conditions. So for example, the activity of an immobilized enzyme can be compared to that of the same enzyme in a solution by measuring the rate of substrate being used up or product being produced over time. Now the advantages of using immobilized enzymes are it makes them more stable. Immobilized enzymes are less sensitive to temperature and pH changes, and that makes them very useful to use in industrial reactions because you can use a slightly higher temperature to speed up the reaction without denaturing the enzyme. It also makes it much easier to separate the product from the enzyme because here we have the enzyme immobilized in alginate beads you could easily just sieve those out and then you have the product remaining in the liquid. You can have the continuous use of enzymes as well. Immobilized enzymes can be used continuously in bioreactors and industry as they're packed into columns or membranes and you just have a flow of your substrate going over them continuously. That means they're also easy to reuse, making it much quicker and also cheaper. And we've got here improved reactor performance. Immobilized enzymes can improve enzyme activity as well by providing a higher local concentration of substrate near the active site. So it increases the rate of reaction also. Next, then we're going to have a look at cell membranes and transport, starting by looking at the fluid mosaic model of membranes. 
So all cells and organelle membranes are composed of a phospholipid bilayer. And this provides a partially permeable membrane so that you can control what can enter and exit the cell. It can also be the site of chemical reactions and have a role in cell communication. So the fluid mosaic model then is this concept that you've got the mixture and movement of the phospholipids, proteins embedded within it, glycoproteins, glycolipids, and also that cholesterol. So it's a mosaic because it's made up of different molecules and it's fluid because there is some movement in this molecule. So left to right movement. The phospholipids align as a bilayer and we talked about earlier in this video that that's due to the hydrophilic heads being attracted and interacting with water on the outside and the hydrophobic tails are repelled so they spin inwards. Proteins within the cell membrane can be intrinsic meaning they or and um, they're called intrinsic or integral and that means they go all the way through the membrane or they can be called extrinsic or peripheral which means they're just on the outside of the membrane. The extrinsic proteins provide mechanical support or they can make glycoproteins. Um, they wouldn't be a glycolipid because that's not got a protein in it. The glycolipid would actually be these green parts which are separate but the function of all of those is cell recognition as receptors as well. Intrinsic or integral proteins are protein carriers and channel proteins involved in the transport of molecules across membranes. Protein channels form these tubes that fill with water to enable water-soluble ions to dissolve and then diffuse through the channel. Whereas the carrier proteins will bind with the ions and larger molecules such as glucose and amino acids and change shape to transport them to the other side of the membrane. Cholesterol is shown here in yellow, and that is present in some membranes, and this restricts that lateral, meaning the side-to-side -side movement, of other molecules in the membrane, and this is useful as it makes the membrane less fluid at high temperatures, and therefore prevents water and dissolved ions from leaking out of the cell. So cell signaling refers to the transmission of messages or signals from one part of an organism to another, and it ensures coordinated responses to internal and external stimuli. This process is vital for the proper functioning and survival of organisms, and the cell membrane plays a role in this. So the purpose of the cell signaling, all the cells and organisms must respond to their environments to be able to survive changes in the environment. And signaling pathways coordinate cellular activities, those pathways could be electrical, for example, in the nerve system, or chemical, for example, in the hormone system, and they involve various molecules such as neurotransmitters and hormones. So the stages in the chemical signaling pathway, and this is where we'll see it link back to the role of the membrane, you have secretion of a specific chemical or a ligand, and cells secrete specific chemical messengers, and that's what the ligands are, in response to a stimuli. And that could be molecules like hormones, for example, glucagon, which is then going to be released into an extracellular space. That will then be transported through the bloodstream, in the case of hormones, to the target cell. And once it gets to the cell, the ligand will bind to receptors on the cell surface membrane of those target cells. And this is where we see the role of the cell membrane in the chemical signaling pathways because they have those receptors on the cell surface membrane. That's what the hormone or ligand can bind to and that will initiate a signaling cascade. So the cell surface receptors are protein molecules located on the cell surface membranes. The ligand receptor binding triggers the conformational changes in that protein receptor allowing the message to be transmitted into the cell. And that process is known as transduction. It often involves G proteins and the production of a second messenger, so another chemical that's going to amplify the effect. Second messengers um, will relay the message by activating enzymes. And once an enzyme is activated, it's gonna cause a chemical reaction to happen inside of the cell. So that sequence of events triggered by the binding to the receptor is known as a signaling cascade, as we just went through. And the receptors can alter cell activity by opening ion channels or acting as membrane-bound enzymes or serving as intracellular enzymes as well. And hydrophobic signaling molecules like steroid hormones 
can diffuse directly across the cell membrane and bind to receptors in the cytoplasm instead, or even in the nucleus. You also have other mechanisms of signaling. So you could have direct cell to cell contact using receptors on the cell surface membrane. So that's what we can see here, for example, antigens embedded on the cell surface membrane. You're gonna have a cell to cell contact through the antibody or an antigen presenting cell and maybe a T helper cell. Next, then we move on to the movement into and out of cells, which is controlled by the cell surface membrane. And there are six key modes of transport that you need to know. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, active transport, and then endo and exocytosis. So simple diffusion is the net movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until equilibrium is reached. This process does not require ATP. It doesn't require a membrane either, even though we can see that here. It doesn't always happen across a membrane. Um, but we can see we've got a concentration gradient, and as long as the molecule is small and lipid soluble, it can then dissolve and diffuse across that membrane until equilibrium is reached. Facilitated diffusion is also a passive process, meaning it doesn't require energy from ATP, and that's because it's still going down the concentration gradient. But this would be used for molecules that are either not lipid soluble or they are large and therefore they have to go through a protein instead because they can't dissolve through the phospholipid bilayer. Now this could be either using a protein channel or a protein carrier. So protein channels for example you would have a channel which is a tube filled with water which would mean ions or polar molecules can dissolve in that water instead of the phospholipid bilayer and then move through that channel by diffusion. Carrier proteins is when you'd have the molecule complementary in shape to that particular protein bind. When it binds, it causes a conformational change, which results in the molecule being released on the other side of the membrane. Water moves across the membrane by osmosis. So your definition of osmosis is the movement of water from an area of higher water potential to an area of lower water potential or more negative across a partially permeable membrane. So there's different types of solution when we think about water potential. Isotonic is when the water potential, which is a measure of how concentrated a solution is, is the same outside of the cell as it is inside of the cell. So iso means equal. Hypotonic is when the water potential of the solution surrounding a cell is more positive, which means it's closer to zero, which in other words means it's less concentrated. So you don't have as much solute dissolved in the solution compared to the cell. Hypertonic is when the water potential of the solution surrounding a cell is more negative than the cell. So a hypertonic solution means that you have more solute dissolved in the water. And we can see here when you place animal cells, which don't have a cell wall, into these three different types of solution, the effect it has on the cell. So if you were to put red blood cells, our example of an animal cell, into a hypertonic solution, because the solution has a more negative water potential, the water is going to move from the cell to the surrounding solution by osmosis, and that causes the cell to shrivel up or crenate. Plasmolyse is a term we use if it's happening in a plant cell. If it's an isotonic solution, because you've got an equal water potential inside and out, there's not going to be any net movement of water. So some water will move in, some will move out, but the cell will stay the same size and shape. Hypotonic solution is when the inside of the cell is more negative compared to the solution in terms of water potential. So water is going to move into the cell by osmosis, which can cause the cell to swell. And if enough water moves in, it causes the cell to burst because there's no cell wall to provide that structural strength. Active transport is the movement of molecules and ions against the concentration gradient. So going from an area of lower concentration to higher concentration. And because it's going against the concentration gradient, energy is required from ATP. And also you need a carrier protein and it is always carrier proteins, not channel proteins. Now this is a selective process 
because it's still linked to the idea of a particular molecule has to be complementary in shape to a specific carrier protein. So ATP is involved and it will bind to the protein on the inside of the membrane. And as it is hydrolyzed into ADP and PI, it's going to release energy. And it causes, that energy causes a change in shape to the protein to cause it to open out to the other side of the membrane. And as it opens up to the other side of the membrane, it releases the molecule to the other side of that membrane. The PI, which is the inorganic phosphate, is then released from the protein, and that causes that carrier protein to revert to its original shape. And as long as there's still ATP, that process can continue. Next time we have a look at endocytosis. And this is a type of active transport, and it is the bulk transport of molecules into a cell. So endo means in. The cell surface membrane will bend inwards around the molecule surrounding it to form a vesicle. The vesicle will then pinch off and moves within the cytoplasm. Um, endocytosis can be classed as either phagocytosis, which is what we can see here on the left, or it could be penocytosis when it is a liquid being taken in. So that's the difference. Phagocytosis is when it's surrounding and pinching inwards with a solid particle. The penocytosis is when it is a liquid. This requires energy from ATP for the cell to engulf and change shape around the material. Exocytosis is our last type, and this is the bulk transport of molecules out of a cell. So vesicles within the cell will move towards and fuse with the cell membrane. And as it fuses, it releases its contents outside of the cell. This process requires energy because ATP is needed to move the vesicle along the cytoskeleton up to that cell surface membrane where it fuses. Now, the surface area to volume ratio is key in considering how fast these types of transport can happen across the cell surface membrane. So exchange surfaces in organisms have very similar adaptations to increase this rate of transport. And surface area to volume ratio is one adaptation that we see. The relationship between the size of an organism or structure, so for example, an organelle, and its surface area to volume ratio plays a significant role in the adaptations. So if we think about, first of all, what surface area to volume ratio means, just looking at cubes, if we were to work out the surface area of this cube, it'd be the area of one side, so one times one is one, but there are six sides, so we times it by six. That's why the surface area is six centimetres cubed. The volume is length times height times width, which would be one times one times one. So the volume is one. So our surface area to volume ratio, you would do the surface area divided by the volume. So six divided by one gives you a surface area to volume ratio of six. You could do the same thing for these cells here as well. So on this one, we've now got a two centimetre in dimension. The picture actually doesn't show the full cube, I've realised, because you've just got um, the first layer where it should be two across. It is two up, but it's not going two back. And the same here, we've got three across, three up, but it's not showing you three back. But it'd be the same idea. You'd work out the surface area of one side um, and then times it by six for a cube. And then the volume is two times two times two. You then do your surface area divided by your volume. And the pattern that we can see is the larger the object, in this case a cube, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio. And that would mean transport would happen slower because you have a lower surface area compared to the volume. So the smaller a structure is, the larger the surface area to volume ratio and therefore the more rapid the transport across the membrane. So that's why small organisms such as amoeba, they have a very large surface area to volume ratio. And that means they don't have any special exchange surfaces like lungs because they can just do simple diffusion across their surface to meet their respiratory needs. But larger organisms, they will have a larger surface area to volume ratio and therefore they will need adaptations to make sure they are 
getting enough oxygen in and enough carbon dioxide out, as well as it could be other structures within the body. And that's why we then start to see these adaptations. Not only that, the larger an organism, they will have more cells and therefore a higher metabolic rate. And they'll have a higher demand for oxygen, but also they'll be producing more waste products that need to be removed. So some of those key adaptations will come up in later topics, but it's ideas such as having microvilli on cells or having millions of alveoli in the lungs as well. So that takes us to the end of topics one, two, three, and four. I hope you found that helpful. If you have, make sure you subscribe to watch future videos and keep a lookout for my A-level notes that are going to be coming very soon for the Cambridge International A-level. As soon as they're ready, I will link them in the description of this video. So check that out now. It might be there already. 